Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson, and welcome to Lecture 10B in this site management course that we're doing. This particular lecture, we're going to look at building information modeling and the impact that it's having on the construction industry, and particularly how it can be useful for the purposes of site management. There's a number of things that we're going to discuss in this um, lecture, including uh, the different uh, levels of BIM, 3D, 4D, 5D, 6D, and the advantages of utilizing this type of model in our construction processes. We're also going to um, be looking at some of the advantages as far as time and cost and reduction of waste. So what is BIM? Really, it is a integration of a number of software programs. Uh, I can remember when I was in Beijing, China in 1996, and I was attending a conference and it was on construction management. And there was this presentation on what they referred to as the virtual constructor. Well, back in 1996, I was thinking like, if I could print something from a computer, I'd be doing good. Uh, and I'm watching this virtual uh, constructor presentation and I'm thinking, wow, this seems so far out there. And uh, I remember thinking, well, it's a long way away, if ever. And next thing I know, uh, it's like 10 years ago and I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it in practical use. And now I see it everywhere and it is just becoming uh, integrated into everything that we do. So as I speak and as if I look back at this lecture in two or three years from now, uh, it's probably going to seem out of date. So you have to think about how change, how rapidly change is taking place in the overall world, because you have to remember 1995, 96, well, Beijing, China was quite different than it is now. Uh, you can think about uh, the Internet of Things was just beginning. The dot com, com bubble was just starting. Uh, Amazon uh, was just uh, beginning. I think uh, uh, Jeff Bezos had it, that idea um, just started. Um, so there was all these things that were going on uh, very early infancy uh, that are now uh, in maturing stages. But then innovation keeps marching forward and we've got artificial intelligence. We've got a lot of things that are going to change the way we do things as far as even the trades I've been noticing uh, with artificial intelligence and some bricklaying um, uh, uh, 3D printing processes that are coming into play. There's a lot of different things that's going to change the way we do. Which ones are going to be the most dominant? I don't know. I don't think anybody has a crystal ball, but I do know things are changing very rapidly. And I think you have to be cognizant of how the changes are occurring and go with the flow with them. Don't try to... Um, don't try to stop them, try to uh, take advantage and leverage them to your advantage. So uh, BIM, it integrates really, you know, it started with 3D models and 3D models have been around for a while. So 3D models, not uh, BIM, uh, 3D models, part of BIM, uh, integration of a number of various uh, components and uh, trades works and design and constructability and schedules and estimating uh, all come into play and build and energy modeling uh, all of these things can come into play in a BIM model right and it can hold a warehouse of information in other words a database of information so the differing levels of BIM which at the end I'll go through um, support different elements and so you can take it from a sort of very basic level to um, the full nine yards depending on the project and depending on what makes sense uh, at that time and what the cost benefit uh, relationship is so definitely uses 3d drawings and models as its base uh, but it is integrating other elements, including schedules, costs, uh, component specifications for things like facility management purposes. And it definitely, when used right, will improve communication between the various stakeholders that are involved in the project. That would include your subcontractors, your consultants, the GC, the client, all of these um, various parties, facilities, managers, etc. 
Uh, so traditional construction for hundreds of years has been 2D design. All right, we draw a flat floor plan, we draw flat elevations, we draw flat section details. Uh, that's traditional. And you know what, even in a BIM model, we still need that. We need to have sort of things with dimensions so that we can review it. We need to have leader lines so we can explain certain components and that sort of thing, and that's fine. Uh, but the model on top of that or underneath it, whichever way you want to review it, because the, you know, in a BIM model, you would be having the 3D model and then you might be taking off layers and cutting through sections and various things to um, show the information that's going on inside uh, different areas. Um, but the, the model is going to clarify the design intent for the project owners. Um, gives you much more accuracy uh, in uh, the information that you're providing to all the parties. I say the owner there, but everybody. Uh, it definitely will help to reduce changes during the construction process. So the best time to save money is before you start construction and even before pre-construction. So if you're in the actual design area and you've involved people that are more knowledgeable than the designer. How much can one consultant know about the design process? They know a lot about the design, but actually then taking that into constructability. Doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter the company, you don't have all the knowledge there. But if you can more readily engage the expertise of a construction manager or general contractor, with the prime sub-trades that are involved in the project early in the design process, then you can come out with a design that not only meets the client's requirements, has the aesthetic target that the um, designer is trying to uh, achieve, but it will also be constructible from a time and cost point of view. Think about that. That's a big difference than the way we do things now. We do a design, we put it out for bidding, somebody is the lucky low bidder, and now they go to try to build it based on the design, and then they find out this doesn't work, that doesn't work, why didn't they do it this way, why didn't they do it that way, and you get conflict, you don't get the necessarily the best value to the client. So if you're a client, you should be thinking, well, I want the best value. Uh, lean thinking gets into a whole nine yards about this, looking at how we can be more productive. And we've talked about productivity in previous lectures, I think five A, B, C, and a whole bunch of different lectures that we've been doing in this course. And we want to look at being more productive. Well, lean thinking looks at how do I provide more value to the client, to the customer? And actually, if you get into details about lean, the customer is whoever you're transferring work to. So the taper is actually um, supplying work to the painter who is their customer. And at the end of the day, the whole project is going to the client. Um, so, but you wanna add value to the client slash customer and you want to reduce waste. How do we do that? We engage the people that have more knowledge in those areas earlier. We have a consultant that takes a collaborative approach with those trades. We have some sort of profit sharing mechanism, and then that ties to what we call integrated project delivery, which works off of a BIM model really, really well. So if we take this the full nine yards with BIM, lean, integrated project delivery systems, uh, there's a lot of opportunities for this in the future. And I see a lot of this moving in that direction. Some elements are moving a little bit quicker than other elements, uh, but there's a lot of opportunities. Whether that's the way things will change to, because there are a lot of people rooted in their ways, we'll see how that evolves in the next few years. But it's very interesting to watch and to see and to be part of um, during this process. It's actually very exciting times from that point of view. Getting back to BIM though, some of the advantages is that it's going to allow us to do a lot more prefabrication. So as I said, the biggest savings for cost 
happens in the design stage. It does not happen when we're constructing things. When we want to change things once we've started the construction phase, it's not going to save time because it's interruptions to work and we need a change order and then basically there's an extra cost and then we've got resistance and then we've got adversarial relationships and we've got claims instead of changes. That's not great. Um, so in a collaborative model, you're trying to get those things resolved before you've started construction. And if you can have more confidence in the design, in the design cycle, then you can actually design for more prefabrication. If you can design for more prefabrication, then that means that you can shorten the install time on site and have other things going on off site in prefab manufacturing centers, in um, warehouses, in factories, etc. I think uh, PCL has a, a great model for this when they built uh, Humber River Hospital and Vaughan Hospital. And I think they've been learning as they've been going. So I think they're, they're well up the, the curve on this. And um, they've been integrating that with some of their major um, mechanical sub, uh, subcontractors as well. And that allows for what they call an agile system. And they have on their website, if you check under PCL Agile or Google PCL Agile, you'll see that they have um, a center where they do a lot of prefab from hospital rooms uh, to various assemblies in the prefab center. Well, when they're prefabbing that stuff there, you know what? It's not on site and it's not in the way of other work that's been scheduled to do. We have what we call the stack effect in construction where we've got too much going on at one time. It's unsafe. People damage things and all of those other things or it's crowded. You ever tried to paint a room uh, full of furniture? Not easy. Uh, so uh, this is part of that better construction management process that you can take the integration of BIM and do things that we couldn't really do before because there'd be the risk if we're prefabbing this, maybe it's not going to fit on site and then we've got to rework it and then that's too expensive, all the rework. So this is moving us ahead by leaps and bounds in these areas. And I suspect as we better build in our processes and systems around BIM, we will be much better at it. So it's kind of a learning curve too. And you got to remember when you're at the bottom of the learning curve, things don't always go as smoothly as you want. So don't necessarily think that that means it's no good. It just means that you're in the process and you're learning from your failures and then you're improving as you go along. I think I may have said this before to you, but I know a lot of people that haven't failed very much but they also haven't done very much. A lot of people that I know have had a number of failures are at the top of their game because they learn from their failures. So integrating new processes, new systems like BIM, you may go through that learning curve, but if, as long as you've got a feedback mechanism that's gonna allow you to improve, you're gonna quickly accelerate and leave the competition behind, at least the competition that's not trying to do the same thing or not doing it as well as you're doing it. So yes, uh, BIM includes the embedment of cost and schedule information. So we looked at, I, in the previous lecture, I did an example in Microsoft Project of a new township project, and I kind of went through how costs are added to it and how that basically can build in a schedule, a cost-loaded schedule. Well, with BIM, we can take all that work we did in Microsoft Project and we can integrate it into the BIM model so that we can actually animate it on a timeline. And so then we could see how this is being constructed and we can really analyze it for constructability, the effectiveness of constructability, the effectiveness of our site layout. Uh, we can do a lot of different areas uh, in BIM models. You can even do for site logistics on the site plan, you know, have the actual concrete trucks and the excavators and the dump trucks. You can have them actually coming along in the model, showing the turning radiuses and turning, seeing how much available space you need. You can work a lot of these things out in the model. And that's a lot easier to do because then you're gonna set it up the site so that it will correspond with what you determine to be the best in the model. So it definitely speeds up that problem solving process, the ability to get and gather information to utilize information as well that we've talked about in the previous lecture 10a on the productivity software so we can also integrate with that 
Clash detection, as I mentioned, um, really looks at how do we um, get that information that we have and integrate it. Um, so clash detection is really looking at how do we get that information that we have and integrate it so that we can be sure that it is accurate. And so if we have the inputs of the various consultants, like the uh, mechanical consultants, the electrical consultants, the structural consultants, the architects, along with the actual um, people that are constructing the project, we can work out a lot of the um, clashes or interferences where one pipe is in the way of another or a structural steel column is in the way of a key pipe. Uh, so how are we going to relocate that pipe as an example? Um, this can be very helpful and it helps to avoid construction delays because you're doing it in the design phase, the de design stage. And I'll reiterate, the biggest opportunity to save money is as early in the project design process as possible. Um, that's where your biggest opportunities and with each day that passes, then that opportunity diminishes and becomes more expensive. And just going back, sorry about that, but going back, uh, 2D drawings, very hard to see everything. Like I've done it with 2D many times, but very hard to visualize exactly elevations when you're working with two-dimensional drawings compared to a BIM model. Like there's no comparison that way. Um, so really, it does build that confidence. It allows us to be able to do a lot more prefab work and with a lot more detail, a lot more accuracy. Um, eliminates um, a lot more of the need to perform field calculations. That plus the advances in scanning technology uh, that are available to make it really good. You, if it's an existing building, there's scanning technology that you can do a scan of the existing building and then you can integrate that scan into the model to make sure that what you're building or what you're designing for is the exact same as what was there uh, with very small differences in tolerances. And this technology is improving just like the technology in self-driving cars is improving by the day. It also ensures that in proper integration with this and productivity software, we can ensure that we've got the most current drawing and the model is up to date and we're able to manage that process effectively. So it's going back to what we talked about in the last lecture between dynamic documents and static documents. Dynamic, as you make the changes, everybody can see the changes that you want to see them, right? Not everybody can see them. If you don't want somebody to see them, you can turn off their rights and then they don't have that. But whoever you need to see it, they see it so that they're not looking at off last month's drawing when things have radically changed and now they're doing the work the wrong way. I can't tell you how many billions, if not trillions of dollars have been wasted in construction project of rework by poor management of drawing dates and current drawings and revisions. So uh, it can also be used after construction. And this is where it adds a ton of value to the facilities owners. So think about University of Toronto. Think about George Brown College uh, facilities. I probably mentioned before, I've done a, a bit of consulting work with um, U of T uh, facilities managers and um, in training and planning and scheduling. And uh, they do a lot of work in a year, typically over a billion dollars in projects most years. It's a lot of work in capital and renovation projects. It's a huge uh, entity, University of Toronto. It's one of the biggest, if not the biggest employers in Toronto. Um, so they, they manage their buildings for, in some cases, well over a hundred years, some of their buildings have been in play. And it's very helpful for them if they have a model and a database of how the building was built. Uh, so uh, you think about um, some of um, the buildings that are at um, U, of, U of T and you think about, I'm trying to think of the one right now that I've been to a gazillion times when I teach down there. Uh, the one that Massey Ferguson uh, built, a beautiful gym inside. It was built in, I think, the 1920s. And 
if they had a nice BIM model of that, that would be nice, but they don't have a nice BIM model of that because they didn't have that technology. So you're doing renovations on that. There's a lot of things you don't know that's in that building. Uh, you know, there's probably asbestos and different things. So you gotta be very careful when you work on it and those types of things, uh, just because of the age of the building. Uh, if you have a BIM model, it would have really all the specifications, all the details of the information, right down to um, valves and um, uh, fire dampers, et cetera, so that you know, ongoing maintenance of the building becomes much more easy, uh, better understanding when you're going to do renovations, you're going to do additions, whatever that may be, um, all of that comes uh, into um, play with it. So. Uh, definitely, that's what we call 6D when it's actually being used for maintenance and uh, operations. That really, you've sold the database of the as-builts, how the what the original drawing specs were, and then the as-builts, what actually happened uh, to the client. And so then they have all of that information. Uh, many of the larger uh, general contractors see this as a huge opportunity for the future to provide value added and extra service to the clients that want that. And pretty soon I think it'll be everybody that wants it because of the complexity. We've talked in other lectures about the commissioning process and the complexity of the building systems. This ties into that, um, right? So it's helping to make that easier uh, to understand and for facilities managers that may change on an ongoing basis, that information there is held uh, within um, that department or entity. Um, so it definitely is, is helpful for that point of view. It's also, which I never really thought originally, uh, going back 10 years, that it would be used for this purpose. So for change and claim uh, management. So there's different software out there. I think there's one called Synchro. I might have the name wrong. Uh, that you can put your, your project on a timeline. The baseline schedule, the original plan, how you intended to assemble the building on a timeline. So it's visual 3D model. And then beside it, you can put the actual timeline. So if they're supposed to be built side by side on a big screen, you put them being constructed. And then all of a sudden, this one hits a delay, a design error, let's say. And so the way this was supposed to be built, this is continuing on and this is stuck because of that delay. It's very impactful when you're doing uh, change and claim cases to be able to demonstrate that in a model. Trying to explain that requires a lot of schedules and requires a lot of documentation and other things, which you can get and which you'll still need because you've got to be able to show that this animation of yours is viable and that it is true. Uh, but to have a um, arbitrator or a judge uh, see that and review that, who probably is not an expert in construction, that is very, very impactful. And that's being used in that way. And it can be used by clients and it can be used by contractors. So it just depends. It's not that one necessarily has another liquidated damages it could be used for. Um, so it can be used in different ways by different um, parties. So it's you know, kind of unfortunately change in claim management that we have to have these issues there. But if we want to get it down that it's not really a claim and that it's not going to court, that we want to settle it out as a change. So remember, a claim is just a change that has not been accepted, right? So it's sort of in that limbo of process, maybe accepted and then you have a change order written, maybe not accepted and then maybe it's going to go to litigation. Uh, the idea in my mind is to not have anything go to litigation. That's always what you want. And the best way to do that is be very professional and to be able to demonstrate the impact of a change that is costing you money. And that's a really good tool to help in that way. So BIM is good for that. So from my, if you've had earlier courses with me uh, in my textbook, Understanding Construction Drawings, you would have seen this. Also in my project management plan and scheduling, I have a similar one. 2D, 3D, 4D, 5D, 6D. So 2D is just regular stuff. It's not really BIM, uh, but we do need it uh, for, like I said, for elevations and floor plans. Uh, 3D is our BIM model, very uh, typically used for clash detection interferences. Most widely used today um, is 3D. Um, for, and as I mentioned, for building systems and clashes and that sort of thing. It's also 
used at a higher level, a little bit on, with 4D. 4D is when you have it on a timeline. So you're watching the project be built, as I was just mentioning with changes and uh, claims. But you can also do 4D to plan out the project. And many GCs will do it uh, to as a selling tool. So they'll do it at a little bit higher level to show the client, all right, so uh, in uh, month one, we'll be here. In month two, we'll be here. And it shows the building kind of going together month by month by month by month. And so the client looks at it and sees their building built before their eyes. And that builds a lot of confidence in the client that it's been a well thought through process. So a 3D model does exact, a 4D model, sorry, does that. So 4D is scheduling. That's at the crux of it. it can be used for a selling tool, can be used for change and claim, and it can also be used for problem solving. A few years back at George Brown, we had a guest speaker and um, they had uh, designed going into New York City and to Penn Station, um, a BIM model, because if you've ever taken the train into Penn Station in New York, um, there were some open areas. They're going to be fewer and fewer. I'm not sure how many open areas there are left now. I think the last time I took a train was about 12 or 13 years ago. Um, but so in those open areas, um, they're slowly being built up with very large condos on each side. And it's a great opportunity to close over the tracks and then have some parkland on the top. And so that's a great opportunity, uh, especially when you're building these huge towers, uh, to do that. But the rail authority in New York really, you know, you can't shut down the, new, the trains into New York. Think about the trains into Union Station in Toronto. Can't shut down the GO trains into uh, the station in University of Toronto. You have to work around it. Uh, and we do a lot of the same similar things where we have those things. Uh, going on. I, I suspect in a few years, uh, if anybody's ever taken the Young Street subway in Toronto, uh, where you see near Davisville Avenue, and it's basically been just angle of repose cut and trenched uh, for that subway, so it's wide open. That land's becoming so valuable at some point, that'll be covered over, uh, maybe as part of a trail system or something like that. Uh, so at that point, um, they won't want to interrupt the, the subway. So you have to come up with a, a means and method of building with that. So in New York, getting back to the point, the rail authority would only allow the contractor to work over the tracks four hours a week. Four hours a week. That's all you could work over the tracks. They could work at the sides, but they couldn't work over the tracks. So they had to come up with a system where they could have a precast concrete um, uh, slabs installed in sections in very short time periods over those tracks. And they had to make sure they, if they were installing one, one or two slabs per week that they could get those slabs in in that time frame. It couldn't be that the slab's half in and they're supposed to be going and all the trains are delayed because there was huge liquidated damages on that. Um, so they did a BIM model and I, the engineering team, uh, which was from Toronto, did a presentation on it and I think they said they had something like um, 70 or 75 different iterations to try to get it down. And they worked out all of the steps during those BIM animations to make sure that it would work on a timeline. Uh, so you're talking minutes that they were working with. So it can be used for those kind of complex uh, uh, designs and constraints that you're dealing with. So 4D, 5D, we can use it for takeoffs, estimating takeoffs, etc., to come up with our costings. And 6D, I've already mentioned, is that facilities database um, that we turn over to facilities that can help them for all their future work and give some real accurate as-built information and maintenance information for their building systems as well. So it kind of gives you that sort of um, overview there. And of course, if you, like I said, even houses can have a BIM model that can be advantageous where you can uh, come up with the processes. And then this, some of this leads to also the opportunities to better pre-manufacture things like paneled systems for the walls, etc., and the floors that can be installed more rapidly and uh, more flexibly. And some of this will lead to condominium structures that are built in stackable units uh, in the future, I am sure, as um, this prefabrication opportunity comes to uh, fruition. I did want to um, show a quick um, video on this, um, if I can. Um, find it here. I think that's it. And I'll just open that up and I'll move my mic over so hopefully you can hear it. All right.
right. And let's uh, give it a go. And this is an Autodesk uh, video. Using Revit and BIM 360 design, architects, structural engineers, and MEP engineers can create coordinated, consistent, and complete model-based designs. Before a construction project breaks ground, it is important to identify and resolve clash and constructability issues. BIM 360 model coordination performs automated clash detection of models hosted on BIM 360, enabling design and trade partners to quickly identify and resolve model conflicts. In addition, users can easily create, assign, and track coordination issues to ensure accountability and resolution. The BIM 360 Issues add-in for Navisworks connects BIM coordinators, VDC managers, and contractors to BIM 360 model coordination directly within the Navisworks environment, enabling them to communicate seamlessly with other project participants. Models from BIM 360 can be opened directly in Navisworks. Simply select the account and project in the BIM 360 coordination dialog box choose from the coordination spaces configured for that project, and open the shared models from the selected locations. This ensures all project participants are working with the same versions of the models. Project team members can view issues that have been created by selecting the Manage Issues icon on the ribbon, and they will see pinned issues created in either Navisworks or BIM 360 model coordination directly in the context of their Navisworks workspace. These issues include an automatic screenshot attachment. This functionality enables project teams to combine the strengths of BIM 360, such as collaboration and automation, with powerful 3D clash detection, 4D construction sequencing and visualization, and 5D quantification capabilities available in Navisworks. The clash detective feature in Navisworks is able to leverage search sets and predefined or user-defined rules to define and perform advanced clash checks on more than 50 file formats. Additionally, clash geometry can be specified to include surfaces, lines, and points, tolerances may be specified, and clearances may be considered to accommodate for unmodeled items and construction variances. Now Navisworks users can easily create and share BIM 360 issues across the project team greatly simplifying communication during the model coordination phase of the project. Once an issue has been addressed or created in Navisworks, users will see it in BIM 360 model coordination and vice versa. The BIM 360 issues add-in for Navisworks enables the best features of both of these products to be used in tandem, providing a single source of truth for model coordination and seamless issue management across the entire project team. So that's pretty much what I wanted to cover there. So that gave you a, an overview and it was really diving into the clash detection. Hopefully you saw the pipe going through um, the column and you recognize that, well, that's not a good thing. That's a very common occurrence. And so in a program like Navisworks, you can set up the tolerances that will, it will review where something hits something else. Now, uh, you have to be kind of cognizant of how you set up the tolerances. That's why usually somebody that's like a, a VDC or a, a virtual design manager, and we often call them a BIM coordinator would be another name for it. Um, they usually have a very strong architectural background and they're able to um, assist in that process. But then collaboratively, you would have the various consultants reviewing the material. Also, the site super very often is going to be looking through to see if there's any potential issues along with the project manager. So it's really sort of a collaborative um, effort in that regard. So um, usually problems that are seen, then that's sort of identified uh, by the virtual design manager or BIM coordinator. And then that issue is then sent to the proper person to try to resolve it. Maybe they can't, and that requires bringing in a different subtrade and try to um, come up with a, a better um, solution. But the point is you're doing that without the actual pieces being built yet, which gives you more opportunity to change the design if necessary uh, from, those, from that point of view. 
which as you can pretty much see, that would add value to the client in a lot of ways. The, one of the biggest issues in this area is that clients don't often recognize the value that this brings. And <laughs> that can be a little bit of a uh, problem into it itself because you know, there's an extra cost for this initial BIM and then it's hard to quantify the savings, but the savings usually are a mul number of multiples of what the BIM cost is. That's some feedback I've had from different clients that I have, you know, try, it's a little bit of a sales initially with clients when something is new. Well, what is this going to really save me? I, all I see is it costing more for the, the model aspect. All I see is the 60 aspect. I got to pay for this extra thing. Well, you won't think it's a, a, a big cost when you find how much easier it is to run your facility and uh, how much accurate information will be when you want to actually renovate or change the design of something and you don't have a pile of rework because there's all these things you're opening up that you weren't aware of. Um, so it's really uh, an educational process uh, that's involved in the selling of certain levels of BIM, to be quite honest. And again, part of that's because it's in its infancy. And um, as I've mentioned, you know, uh, it, you're going to, new technology, you tend to have failures. And uh, with those failures uh, comes a learning process. And then as you get better, uh, then you develop a resilience and a competitive advantage over others who have not bothered to try it because of fear of failure. Uh, you know, that, that saying that I use is that people that I know lots of people that haven't failed very much, but they haven't done very much. And those that have failed and learned from those failures have gotten to be very successful in what they do. Trust me, I've failed in a lot of things and I think I'm doing pretty good. Uh, so keep that in mind and uh, that's what I wanted to cover. So Tom Stevenson, uh, wishing you a wonderful day. And uh, next, uh, we'll be looking at the uh, change and clean processes and project closeout uh, in our next lecture. So uh, stay tuned and have a wonderful day. Bye for now.